So uh, in our continuing series in Jesus in the Old Testament, we approached the topic of Jesus and the tabernacle. So what we're going to do tonight is talk about how Jesus is pictured in the tabernacle. When I say tabernacle, I'm not talking about the temple in Jerusalem. I'm talking about the tent tabernacle that was a portable temporary unit that they would construct and then tear down and move. And this is like given to them in the law of Moses and they carried and continued to have it until the time of Solomon. They continued to have this tabernacle set up um, more often than not. So this is in Exodus 25 through 40. Uh, You're welcome to read those 16 chapters really quick right now in preparation. But I'll give you the, the overview and how it parallels Christ, at least in my opinion. I admit some of this stuff is conjecture. Some of this stuff is me going, I think maybe this, I think maybe that. But we're allowing conjecture in our Jesus in the Old Testament search as long as we start with New Testament theological truths and then we conjecture how those are pictured in the Old Testament. We're not making up new stuff. We're not here creating new theology. And we'll talk about that next week when we get into bad examples of typology and how not to do typology. But um, one of the things we get that's important to note is that the tabernacle was designed by God, not man. That is, it wasn't, okay, the temple, Solomon's temple, it was patterned after the tabernacle, but Solomon changed a lot of stuff. Like if there was one of them in the tabernacle, Solomon made like seven of them. He's like, ooh, lampstand, good idea. Let's make seven of those. You know, like he, he like, elevated everything next level but the tabernacle was all very specific just to God's instructions it was designed by God not man so Exodus 25 9 God says to Moses exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture so you shall make it it really mattered to God that they made it just in a specific way and that's why in Exodus you got 16 chapters and it kind of goes like this make it like this make it like this all the instructions and then it's like And -and so-and-so made it like that, and -and so-and-so made it like this. And it's really careful to make us know we followed God's given pattern in making this tabernacle. A great deal of scripture is is actually devoted to this topic. So because of this, we have a really good idea of what it looked like. Because we just look at the description in the text. So this is an approximation of what it looked like. It was about 150 feet by 75 feet. That's the entire area, the footprint of the whole thing, including the outer area as well as the inner area. It had some furniture stuff on the outside, the bronze, uh, the, the bronze offering altar, and then, of course, the, the bronze laver or the, washing, the wash basin they had there. And then, of course, you had the, the enclosure. Um, notice it was all portable. It's all made out of tents and skins and, like, cloth and stuff that they could actually pick up, pack up, and move with them as they were wandering through the wilderness, as they were looking for their homeland. So it's a temporary structure. Now, Solomon, of course, is the one who took this and made it into the temple, but that was, again, like, you know, 500 years after Moses, when Solomon did that. So here is, here's some aerial footage from, the, from an ancient drone. And <laughs> this, but it gives you the idea, it's like, they, they, would, they would perform these sacrifices, offerings and sacrifices, they had to happen at this tabernacle. That was the one location in Israel where it was approved to do these sort of offerings and sacrifices. You couldn't just do it wherever you want. They were rebuked all the time because they had sacrifices, oh, in the high places here and there throughout the Old Testament, but it was supposed to happen here. One location for these things to take place. Only the priests are supposed to be in there doing that stuff, right? Only the Aaronic priests are supposed to go inside the actual temple uh, or tabernacle proper. Um, So this is, you know, they offer the animals, they do the washing, the cleansing, they have different rituals and things that they do there. Even the feast days and things like Passover, the Day of Atonement, special things would happen right there in the tabernacle, which would sit, interestingly enough, while they're traveling through the wilderness, it would sit in the middle of all the tribes. The tribes literally encamped around the tabernacle so that it was at the center of the people of Israel. So all I'm saying is it was a big deal. Inside the tabernacle, inside the actual tabernacle, we have two two separate sections. What we have is the the holy place, which is um, that, that large section you're looking at. Then we have the holy of holies. The holy of holies was about 15 feet by 15 feet, and it was separated from the holy place by this thick veil that ran between the two. Inside the Holy of Holies, there's only one real piece of furniture thing there, and that is, of course, the Ark of the Covenant. Outside, we have three pieces of furniture. We'll look at each of those. Um, I I hate to use the word furniture. I'm not sure what other term to use to describe them, but we'll look at those individually. Um, So, let's continue. Why is God so concerned about what it looks like? Now, if you don't know about Jesus, you might just be like, He's God, don't worry about it. Like, <laughs> do what he says, and I agree, do what he says. 
But now that we can look and know that in the volume of the book, it speaks of him, that, you know, all through the scriptures, they speak of Christ, according to Jesus. Now I can say, I think the reason, one of the reasons why is because it's an amazing picture of Christ. Not only the things that happen there, but even in the way it's built. So is that me completely, is that complete conjecture? I don't think so. I think I can actually tie this to New Testament truths. As pretty much every type we've looked at, I've been able to say the New Testament gives us good reason to look for this typology. I haven't kind of just gone on my own yet, but (laughs) I just said it's in the New Testament. So it is, I think, with Jesus and the tabernacle. So in John chapter 2, you guys know this passage where he's overturning the money changers' tables and he's pretty upset about what's going on inside of the temple, which became the permanent replacement for the tabernacle. And he's upset there, right? But then they ask him, what authority do you have to do this? Overturning the money changers' tables you know, causing this ruckus. What, who gives you authority to tell us what happens in the temple? And Jesus answers them in John 2, 19. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews then said, it has taken us 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Now, I'm, I'm not going to hang everything on this, but here's just a passage where Jesus deliberately confuses the difference between the temple and his body. And he refers to his body as this temple when he's standing at the temple. And they're asking him about the temple. And he refers to his body as the temple. So that's just really interesting. Now couple this with a passage earlier in John, John 1.14. In John 1.14, it says of Jesus, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now we know this passage, you might be like, Okay, how does this have to do with the tabernacle? Well, the word dwelt, there it is in the Greek, skenao, skenao, excuse me. Skenao is a Greek word that actually can be translated to live or camp in a tent. In the New Testament, this word's only used by John. Like, they don't even use this term for the most part throughout the rest of the New Testament. Um, It's just not there. John uses it, and he uses it here in one case. It could literally mean to pitch a tent and dwell. That's from the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. So it's saying, and some translations actually put it this way, the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us, because it means to dwell in a tent amongst us. So that's just an interesting terminology there. Later, John uses the same term in Revelation 21.3. Really, I'll just read it to you. I don't have a slide for it, but it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne here at the consummation of all things. It says, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, with man. He will dwell with them, tabernacle with them. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. So here's another use of the term. So he takes a term that seems to be similar to the term tabernacle. It means to dwell in a tent. He refers it to Jesus tabernacling amongst us and then the final consummation, it's, okay, now it's fully achieved. God is with us. Um, God is with us. So very interesting, interesting stuff. But there's another connection, and that's in John 1.14 when it says, He dwelt or tabernacled amongst us, and we saw his glory. We've seen his glory. Well, that's interesting because it reminds me of Exodus 40. In that same, remember the, the passage of Exodus we're talking about? Right, here's Exodus 40. Here is the end after the tabernacle's built. And after it's all built, after it's finally been tabernacled, <laughs> amongst them. It says in Exodus 40, 33 and 34, so Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So once the tabernacle was built, they saw in some sense, the glory of God. And so Jesus, he came and he tabernacled and we saw his glory. So we see there's these, these connections, these sort of literary connections between Jesus and the tabernacle. I think it's really interesting. Also Hebrews, We won't get into this for the sake of time, but Hebrews talks about uh, how the sacrifices that took place in the temple were ultimately all about Christ and all pointing to Christ. And it talks about how the high priest and his function as high priest was all about Christ and pointed to Christ. And so Hebrews talks about the functions of the temple. We we know that the, the feasts that took place at the tabernacle or temple, they also pointed to Christ. And here we have some connections in John as well. That's pretty interesting to me. So let's talk about the tabernacle. The purpose of the tabernacle. What was the point? What was the big idea behind the tabernacle? Well, it had one overarching purpose, and it wasn't primarily just to do sacrifices. Rather, the sacrifices were done to achieve the purpose. And the purpose is Exodus 25, 8, as he's telling them about the tabernacle, beginning the instructions. He says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. 
the reason for the tabernacle in the middle of Israel was so God could be with his people. I want to be with them. Now, he couldn't just dwell with them without any sort of separations because he would destroy them. So he was like, let's deal with this sin problem. I can dwell with you, but it will require this tabernacle and these constant sacrifices because of your sin issues. But then he'll dwell with them. In Exodus 29, 45, it says, I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. Again, this is the same Exodus passage, the section where it's dealing with how to build the tabernacle. So he's describing the tabernacle when he says, I'll dwell with them. Now in Matthew 1, 23, how it relates to Jesus, right? Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Why did Jesus come? So God could be with us. What, what, well, wasn't it really all about the sacrifice? Yes, but the sacrifice was all about God being with us. The goal was to restore the relationship of man with God. And the tabernacle was to allow God to have a relationship with his people. Although it was limited and it was lesser because the fulfillment is better than the type, right? The, 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 the thing is better than the shadow of the thing. You may recognize this image from Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> We're going to talk about the furniture now, right? Inside the Holy of Holies, there was what's called the Ark of the Covenant. And this ark is basically, it's, and we're talking about the lower part. There was in two pieces. There was the container portion down below, and there was the solid gold lid we'll talk about later called the mercy seat. But, the, um, but it had these rings, gold rings, where you could actually put poles so they could carry it, because remember, it had to be portable. Um, no, it probably didn't look quite exactly like this, but it's, you know, here's an interesting image uh, that might help give you an idea. So the ark was about two feet high, the, the container part, not the lid, was about two feet high and about three feet wide and uh, two feet deep. So it was two by three by two, is that, I don't know how you're supposed to say that. And it was made out of acacia wood and it was covered in solid, uh, covered in gold, not solid gold, I guess. Gold, what do you call that? Inlay. Inlay? That's fancy. Inlay, I'll go with that. Acacia wood, if you do some research on acacia wood, you find out that it's a particular tree that grows in the Negev Desert, which is where they were traveling and wandering for their 40 years in the wilderness. Interestingly enough, the, the desert doesn't have very many thorny trees. And according, at least according to my sources, it was the, the only thorny tree out there was the acacia. Here's its branches. Here's some examples of the thorns. Most likely, most likely this is what they used for the crown of thorns of Jesus because it's local to the area and it would make an appropriate you know, crown of thorns. <clears throat> thorns, we know, are a sign of the curse, right? The, the curse of, of, that falls upon Adam and Eve is the thorns on the, the ashes to ashes, dust to dust, right? To dust you will go. And also thorns. The ground will bear thorns. So in a sense, Jesus has a crown. He's wearing this thing that is to represent the curse. How interesting. And the ark is made out of that same material. In fact, all the wood for the tabernacle was made out of this same material. Very interesting. So there's a, there's a connection there, I think. It was overlaid in gold, so it would just look magnificent. And in fact, all the inside was just covered in gold. You just see gold everywhere if you were inside. And so I used to say at this point, because I, I, I was looking at my old notes, I've taught this a long time ago, and I used to say at this point that um, gold represents divinity. And as I was looking at my notes, I did one of those things I do every once in a while, and I go, how do I know that? And I thought to myself, how do I know gold represents divinity? So I, I actually started looking and looking for gold in scripture where it appears in scripture and I try to, and I like can't justify that claim. I don't know why I ever said that. Like it's one of those things you hear a teacher say it and you figure it's true and you don't realize that you're just kind of repeating something. One of my goals is to stop repeating things that aren't <laughs> maybe the case. So I'll, I'll just throw it out there. I don't know that gold represents divinity. I think it is clear though that gold does represent wealth. Gold definitely represents wealth. That seems pretty clear in scripture. And in heaven, the streets are paved with gold to represent the immeasurable wealth that there is in heaven. And so here you go inside and it's all covered in gold to represent, I think, heaven, the wealth of God in heaven. You're entering into kind of like this, the throne room of God is the idea. Um, so three things were inside. Again, I said this is a container. There's three things in the container. Inside of it, one of them is the two tablets of stone carrying the Ten Commandments that uh, Moses wrote down after he broke the other ones. The Ten Commandments. Now, how does that represent Jesus? Well, Jesus shows up. Matthew 5, 17, he says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Christ fulfills the things that are written here. He actually does it. Now, they all failed, but Christ fulfills it. They stand there forever in the middle of Israel as this constant testimony of what the people aren't doing. You're failing. You're sinning. 
Jesus comes and he actually accomplishes it. He actually does it. So the Ten Commandments represent God's righteous standards. They're kind of picturesque of all of God's moral truths. You know, it's kind of like standing in that representative, representative place. Jesus fulfills it. He walks the perfect life. He lives sinlessly. He obeys the law. The second thing that was inside the ark is some of the manna from heaven. Some of the manna that the people would gather as they traveled through the wilderness. They, they took some, they put it in a gold jar, and they placed that jar inside of the actual uh, tabernacle itself. Now, we've already seen how this relates to Christ, the manna. We've already seen at least some of it. I haven't gotten into great detail. We can actually study the passage about the manna and just kind of like analyze how it's described and how that relates to Jesus. But let me give you Jesus' words on the subject. John 6, 32. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. This is completely typological language, right? Jesus is saying, oh yeah, you had the manna, but the fulfillment, the real bread from heaven was me all along. And so he gives us this type. This is a type from the mouth of Jesus. In John 6, 49, he says, your, uh, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So we have the Ten Commandments picturing Christ's moral perfection. We have the manna from heaven presenting, uh, picturing him offering of himself for our life. Him giving us life. So he deals with the thing that gives us a death penalty and he gives us life. The third thing's really neat. Do anybody remember the third thing that's in there? Right? Here's a photo of it. Aaron's rod that budded. <laughs> I, can't, I couldn't find a good picture of this, but Aaron's rod that budded. Now, the event where this happens to explain what, what this rod is all about. The rod is the rod Aaron carries around with him, right? It also tends to represent your authority and your commands and your, your power and stuff, your rod. It's symbolic of those things. Well, in Numbers chapter 17, the leaders of Israel gather against Moses and Aaron, and they're like, hey, we can do what you do. You're not so special. So they're kind of rebelling against him. They want the authority that Moses and Aaron have. In Numbers 17, 5, God's like, I'll straighten this out for you. And he tells each of the, the leaders to take their rods, the 12 rods, and then the, rods of, the rod of Aaron. So 12, 12 rods and Aaron's rod, and put them all before the Lord. And then he says in verse 5, and the staff of the man whom I choose shall sprout. These are wood, right? It's dead wood. But the dead wood will sprout living produce on that dead wood to show you something. I'm choosing that guy. That's interesting. Number 17, verse 7, it says, Moses deposited the staffs before the Lord in the tent of the testimony. What was the tent of the testimony? That's the tabernacle. But, they, but what if they hadn't built it yet? Well, that's, here's the thing. Moses would go and meet with God. He would meet with God in a tent. And God would speak to him there, or talk to him face to face, so to speak. And he would get instructions from God. That's the tent that became the tabernacle. It was moved into the middle of Israel. It was, it was sort of expanded, but it was built based upon that. So Moses deposited the staffs before the Lord in the tent of the testimony. On the next day, Moses went into the tent of the testimony. And behold, the staff of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms and it bore ripe almonds. So it's the rod that budded. The rod that budded. I think that this is, I mean, here we have a living tree that was killed, that was placed here in, in you know, before the, test, before the uh, tent of the testimony and then it buds life out of death. This is what it represents. Life out of death showing you who God chooses. Consider that. Consider that. Chapter 18 of Numbers tells us why he was chosen. In Numbers 18, if you just keep reading, I love, this is why I love typology. Just keep reading. You're like, what's next? What will I see next in the text? Well, here it is, Numbers 18. So the Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons and your father's house with you shall bear iniquity connected with the sanctuary. And you and your sons with, with you shall bear iniquity connected with your priesthood. Now they had an inferior priesthood. But God's like, I'll show you who I pick. And once he picks Aaron, he's like, Aaron's the guy. He's my choice. Choice for what? To bear iniquity. If you don't see the typological connection to Jesus, you're not paying attention. Like this is Jesus. He, he dies and he rises again to demonstrate that God has chosen Jesus as the one who successfully bore our iniquity. Acts 17.31. Because he has fixed a day 
on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed or chosen. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Acts is like saying the same thing about Jesus that Numbers 18 says about Aaron. I'm going to prove to you who I chose because I'm going to bring life out of death over here. And I'm going to prove to you I've chosen Jesus because I've raised him from the dead. Super cool stuff. I love this, this typology stuff. So wonderful. Um, and perhaps we'll do more on the high priest sometime because you could do a whole thing on just him. And there's a lot more content that's there. Um, <clears throat> but here's the idea. You know, you've got, you've got the Ark of the Covenant inside of it. You have the commandments representing God's holiness that Jesus actually fulfilled. The, the manna representing him giving his life or offering him, himself to death. And you have Aaron's rod that budded to represent his resurrection and life and God's affirmation that Jesus really is the one. He is the one who bore the iniquity for us. Then you have the top. The top of the, of the Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat. And it's not wood overlaid with gold. It's just solid gold. It's solid gold. And it was made in a particular way. It had these two cherubim. The two cherubim, right? Cherub is singular. Cherubim is plural. So you could say cherubims. But that's like adding an extra, the I am in the, in the Hebrew is, is, an, is like an S in English. So cherubim. So there's these two angelic type beings. We don't know exactly what they look like, right? But they did have their wings stretched out forward in some sense covering that area. But that area in the middle of the mercy seat, that was to stay totally empty. This is where a pagan would have put an idol of their God. Right there on that mercy seat, right there. Here's where the idol goes. Like this is the holiest spot in the holiest spot on the solid gold, like mercy seat. Like that's where the idol would go. God says, don't put anything there. Don't make an image to represent me. Um, he's not of this creation. You, there is nothing you can make that won't just be an offense unto him to represent him in that sense. And so there's just an open space to represent God's presence. That's the idea. It's an empty space. Jesus, of course, the center of it all, he comes and he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Isn't that interesting? I mean, he is God with us. He is God's presence right there with us. <clears throat> the mercy seat, it, you wonder why is it called mercy seat? Well, its main function, it seems, is that um, the high priest would come into there once a year. He would come into the Holy of Holies and he would offer one thing and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. It's the only thing that would touch the mercy seat. And it was blood. During the Day of Atonement. He'd offer the blood. He'd, he'd put the blood on the mercy seat. And so in a sense, it's like, here's, here's the connection God and you will connect through the sacrifice. You know, and that's what's going to happen. Jesus comes and, he, and we, there's a meeting through a sacrifice, a connection between humans and God through a sacrifice. For homework on this, on the mercy seat and all that, I, I don't have time for it today, but Hebrews 9, I recommend verse 6, six through 14. Hebrews 9, 6 through 14. Or if you're watching the video, you can just pause it. And, uh, and, and hey, you're back. Welcome back. <laughs> um, Okay, so <clears throat> that's on the mercy seat. Um, but let's continue. Okay, so now that's, that's the holiest place, right? Then we'll talk, that's the Holy of Holies. We'll talk now about the holy place or the place that is the, the larger portion of the tabernacle area. And there's three different pieces of furniture in there. And one of them, this unfortunately shoddy picture that I've got here, is, is supposed to be the, the table of the showbread. This is in the holy place. It's wood overlaid with gold, same as the other structure. It's about 36 inches long, 18 inches wide, and about 27 inches high, approximately. They measured things by cubits, so they were like a cubit and a half, you know, that. But it's about that size, so it's not super big, and it has 12 loaves placed on it. These 12 loaves seem to represent the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. There was also wine with it. Now, as you, when you read in Exodus, it's, you, you, you hear about vessels for pouring, and then as you connect that with passages and numbers, you realize, okay, this had, there was wine as well, <clears throat> which is really interesting because it means there's, there's bread and wine there. One of the only things that's there before, before God in the tabernacle, bread and wine. What does that make you think of? When's the last time we saw bread and wine in the scripture, right? Melchizedek, and he offers him bread and wine. And then we see Jesus, and he offers us the bread and the cup as representative of his sacrifice, or in our, in our church's case, bread and grape juice, um, which, is, which is entirely fine. I'm cool with that. Uh, I prefer that, actually. I'd be a little, probably, at this point, I'd probably just be freaked out if I just drank wine. <laughs> what, what was that? <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. But it, was, but it was wine, yes. Um, <clears throat> now, it was also offered with frankincense. So frankincense was mixed in there. And one of the things that was offered to Jesus upon his birth was frankincense, interestingly. Just an interesting thing to know about. So it's the table of the showbread. I think the, connect, the closest connection to Jesus here is communion. And the question I have with the loaves is like, are they supposed to represent Israel? Are they supposed to be an offering from Israel to God? Or that God will offer this to Israel? 
or and I don't know the answers to those questions. I wonder. I still ponder. One day maybe I'll one of you will tell me. I don't know. Okay. The next piece of furniture is the lampstand. The lampstand, which I'm showing you this for a reason. This is the Ark of Titus, the Arch of Titus, um, and it was built about 82 AD, about 12 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. When they destroyed Jerusalem, it was Titus who was the general in charge, and they plundered the temple, or so we think. Well, about 12 years later, when Titus died, his brother had this built to commemorate him. And so he, of course, commemorated him partially by showing his his plundering of Jerusalem. Like it's them, it's like, oh, look at, look at how strong we are as Romans. And one of the things you see in the picture there is implements from inside of the temple. And that looks like a lampstand, doesn't it? So this may be the oldest living image of what the lampstand actually looked like inside of the temple. Now, is that the same lampstand? Does it look identical to the one that we had from Moses' time? I don't know. Um, I don't know all the details there. Maybe, perhaps it is. Is that even accurate? Or did the artist just do artsy things like they do with Jesus all the time, right? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But, but here's a modern day reproduction in Israel because they're preparing to build the temple. They, there's actually a place called the Temple Institute. You can look them up online. And they actually have built the implements for the temple. They've gathered high priest garments. They've done a lot of work to try to like prepare for the temple to be built. And they're hoping it'll happen soon. So this gold lampstand may have looked something like this. Um, solid gold. It was made out of solid gold. Um, I think that, uh, that it probably would have looked really pretty. It was, it was supposed to look organic, like not just like a lampstand, but it was meant to look like, like it was have elements of nature embedded into the actual lampstand itself. And so almond blossoms and leaves and stuff like that were actually supposed to be designed into it as, as part of the lampstand. This is different than a menorah. You may have seen menorahs before. A menorah is different in that it has more candles and the one in the middle is the highest with a menorah. And that's because they're representing a certain number of days as they're commemorating um, the uh, Hanukkah and the, uh, the, the cleansing of the temple after Antiochus Epiphanes. And this is probably too much information for you guys. But uh, basically, it's a different event and different thing. But they do pattern it to make it look a lot like this lampstand, um, which is appropriate because it's about the cleansing of the temple. But anyhow, this is the lampstand versus the menorah, two different kind of things. Seven lamps. There's actually seven lamps all together, and we look at seven as kind of like a number that tends to represent God, it seems, in the scripture. It, if nothing else, it's at least a number of completion and fullness. Um, and, uh, and almond blossoms. Again, almond blossoms. That's the second time almonds have come up, isn't it? Aaron's rod that budded. It budded almonds. So I'm like, why almonds? Is I'm preparing for tonight, you know, I'm like, why almonds? I've never looked into that. I'm just curious. What's unique about almonds? Well, almond, the almond tree is the tree that blooms before any of the other trees do. It actually starts putting out its blossoms in the middle of winter in January before any of the other trees do. And so in God's, uh, God's conversation with Zechariah, there's a time where he goes, what do you see? And he goes, I see an, al uh, an almond tree. And it's, it's, it's budding. And so God's like saying, though it's the dead of winter, I'm going to bring forth life, is the idea. You know, it's the one, you know, you see all these dead trees, and then there's the almond tree. It's got life. It's like the first one to bring life of, during the year. Really interesting. Um, the almond tree is actually, in the Hebrew, it comes from a word that means to watch or to wake. Just the word itself, because it would blossom early. So I think that's just, that's interesting. That's interesting. I do see a connection, to the, possibly, to Jesus there. And then the lampstand itself not only would it produce light in the sanctuary, but it was the only light in the tabernacle. There was no light. Interestingly enough, there is zero light behind the curtain, behind the veil. There's nothing producing light there except perhaps the glory of God. There's nothing. But here in the, in the tabernacle area where they would come more frequently, you have the lampstand, and they were to never let it go out. It could never go out. It always had to have oil from olives constantly producing light. <clears throat> Jesus, he says... John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You know, within the, in the context of the tabernacle, that was the light of the tabernacle, right? Jesus comes, he says, I'm the light of the world. And it's maybe perhaps in a greater sense. Um, he then calls us to be the light as well. The, uh, the gold itself was of hammered work. And that's specifically what the text says. It says it had to be of hammered work. The, the, the lampstand. The other items in the tabernacle are not called hammered. This is called hammered work. You have to beat it. You have to beat it into shape. That's the idea. Um, 
it was hammered or beaten work. I think Isaiah 53, 5 seems to indicate Jesus was beaten. He was, he was, in, he was crushed. He was bruised. He was pounded for us. He was beaten for us. So there's thorns connected to this. There's a beating connected to this. And there's something else in the tabernacle that was also beaten. That's Exodus 27, 20. You shall command the people of Israel that they bring to you pure beaten olive oil for the light that a lamp may be regularly may regularly be set up to burn. So there, the olive oil itself had was pure beaten olive oil. I mean, he could have just said olive oil. But he says pure beaten olive oil. Olives show up in the New Testament as well. In one particular moment when Jesus in, is in the Garden of Gethsemane, which some of you know means the Garden of the Olive Press. It was literally an olive grove where they were growing olives. He's in the garden of the olive press, where the olives are pressed, where they're smashed to produce their oil. And here Jesus is sweating great drops of blood, and he is bearing this incredible burden of, of, of what's about to happen, and who knows what was going on spiritually with him at the time. Jesus was crushed for us, so I, I think that's really uh, interesting. <clears throat> oil does represent in Scripture the Holy Spirit. Zechariah chapter 4, you can read for that. Uh, in Zechariah 4, we get that the oil represents the Holy Spirit. And so here we've got <clears throat> this idea of he's crushed. It, and this is conjecture, I admit it. <laughs> okay, but, the, but possibly Jesus being crushed to produce this sort of oil for the rest of us. Jesus says, unless I go, the Holy Spirit won't come. Like, I need to go through this so that you guys can be vessels of the Holy Spirit. That he had to be crushed, pressed, so to speak, that the oil would come to us. And then he says, you're the light of the world. So as we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we are the lights. I think that's really neat. So we have um, the, the final furniture piece there. We've talked about the Ark of the Covenant. We've talked about the table of showbread. We've talked about the lampstand, the golden lampstand. And now we're going to talk about the final piece that was right there in front of the curtain, in front of the veil, and that is the altar of incense. The altar of incense. And some people think like incense is evil, like if you burn incense for any reason, you're part of some sort of cult type thing. And... Um, incense was used in the tabernacle and it has a wonderful purpose and sometimes it has a really nice smell also in case you didn't know that um, I don't burn incense but I'm just saying don't make it spiritual it's just incense anyway so this is this is the altar of incense constantly burning there constantly producing these fumes that would come up fill the tabernacle with a certain odor in fact if you came near it you would it would smell nice well it smell like incense and barbecue is what it would smell like probably if you came near there um, but Here's a possible representation of what it looked like. Um, again, it was portable, so it had poles. You could, you could take it up and move it. Um, the altar of incense, according to Exodus 30, constantly always rising before the Holy of Holies. And probably the, the only thing that was always coming in through the Holy of Holies, through that curtain, would be the smoke of the incense. It would be the only thing that was able to somehow just permeate through the curtain and fill the room is incense. And what does it represent? This is easy, guys. Incense represents prayer in scripture. Psalm 141, 2, let my prayer be counted as incense before you. Probably the psalmist is thinking about the tabernacle and the temple and how there was literally incense before you. And he says, let my prayer be like incense before you coming in to your presence. Revelation 8, 4, it says, in the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. So here it's very clear in scripture, incense is a picture of prayer coming before God, a pleasant aroma, a beautiful thing, entering right into his presence. And of course, we pray, how's this relate to Jesus? <laughs> we pray through Christ. We pray through Jesus. It's in Jesus, his name that I pray. Now, whether you say in Jesus' name isn't the rule, but I don't get to come to God at all without Jesus. And it's, it's in his name that I come to pray. It's in his name that God receives my prayers and hears me and answers. So um, the incense, I think, represents that Christ brings our prayers to God. It entered behind the veil. How neat, how neat. And it was always, always, always burning. And we're told in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 to pray always. Just pray always. Pray constantly. Pray all the time. And so, interesting stuff. Now, you might think we're done, but next we're going to look at the coverings. Because if you've noticed, there's actually these layers of coverings, uh, multiple layers of coverings, four of them actually, on top of the uh, the uh, the tabernacle. So we're going to talk about that in a second. But let me let me show you um, first the veil. So uh, this is okay. Maybe not the highest quality reproduction, but 
something visual for you to look at. So you have the veil, and the, and the veil, and inside of the temple, it just or the tabernacle, it just looked beautiful. There were actually a, there was a lot of artwork in there. Now I know there was no images to represent God, but there were other images just to represent that that this is a glorious heavenly type of location, you know. And the veils there, some say the veil may have been about 18 inches thick. I don't know how thick it was. I'm not really sure. It, but it, the point is it separated you from the Holy of Holies. You can't go in. That's the idea. There was actually no entrance. The veil didn't have like, like curtains. You couldn't pull it aside and walk through. When the high priest came once a year, he had to crawl under the veil. He had to go under the veil in order to, uh, to access it. Um, this veil, I think, shows our separation from God. Think about this. Like, you see the tabernacle there, right? And, and the priests, they can enter in, but you can't go inside there, right? Only the Aaronic priests can even go inside the actual tabernacle itself. So only one group of within the priests can do that. And then the veil, not even the high priest can do that except one day of the year. And he has to do it twice on that day. First, he comes and he offers an offering for his own sin. Then he has to come back and he can offer for the people. So we're saying you are separate. God wants to dwell amongst you, but you're still totally separated from him in many ways. Jesus comes and he fixes this. In fact, in fact, in scripture, Mark 15, 37, at the moment Jesus dies, it says, and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. What do you think that means? The separation's over, guys. The price has been paid. Could you imagine being the priest who goes in there and they go, and they're, you're looking at the ark and you're like, I'm going to die. You know, and, and you're like, what does this mean? What does this mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means that the price has been paid. And that's how the Bible interprets this. Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. See, this is sacrificial language. This is like how they would enter by, the, by blood into the holy places as priests. So we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. So here we have a New Testament type connection that the curtain is his flesh. As Christ was pierced, as he died, as he was broken, so the curtain was torn open. So the way was made. So there's another New Testament type connection to the curtain, uh, to the tabernacle. All right. We ain't done yet. So here's the, here's the four coverings. Here's the four coverings. And then we could go on even longer than tonight, but it's just so much neat stuff. So the four coverings, uh, the tabernacle itself, again, it was about 15 feet wide and it was about 45 feet long. It had four layers of coverings and, it was, and those layers were on a skeleton of wood and all that wood was overlaid with gold and everything or, or, or bronze in some cases. Each of these represents potentially different things about Jesus. So let me walk you through some possibilities. This is conjecture here, but I think that it's not without reason. I don't think I'm fabricating it. The first layer was linen. It was linen. Linen is white, right? White and linen tends to represent holiness in the scripture. Pure, clean garments tend to represent good, good works and righteousness, that sort of thing. Um, whereas dirty garments, are filthy garments represent sin. Our sin is like filthy rags and things like that. Um, it was, it was not, it didn't stay white though, as you can see, it was dyed purple, blue, and red. It was dyed all three of these different colors and it had all sorts of decorations in it as well. So it's this beautiful thing. And this is, if you were inside the tabernacle, you'd look around you and this might be the, the stuff that you see. You would see this beautiful, beautiful stuff. So purple, blue, and red. Well, purple tends to represent royalty. Um, Jesus was given a purple robe to mock him and call him the king of the Jews. This was because purple robes were generally the royal and the rich. Um, the uh, the blue, blue, I, I mean, perhaps the blue represents heaven. I mean, as you look up in the sky, it's blue. <laughs> like, perhaps you're seeing these different colors. The red, interesting is the word here is toloth. And those of you who know the Psalm 22, toloth worm, that's that red that they used to dye the temple. I don't have enough time to get into it today, but I think I've covered it in this Jesus in the Old Testament series. Did I? No. If not, then I will. Then I will, because it's really neat stuff. This neat worm that where I'm a worm and no man, and how that worm itself may, may be a picture of, of Christ. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so we have the, the blue, the purple, the red, um, maybe representing Christ's sacrifice. Um, inside was amazing. If you walked in the, in the tabernacle, I feel like you'd think you were like in, entering into heaven. It would feel like you were entering into God's presence and this gold and these beautiful images and pictures of like, like angels and things like that. The second layer was goat skin. 
okay, this kind of takes a step down, doesn't it? <laughs> like it's goat skin and all these beautiful linens and stuff. It's goat skin. Now goats look dirty, in case you haven't seen one before. And goats sometimes may have symbolized sin because in the sacrifices, not only do you offer them sometimes for sin, but there's a scapegoat that represents the sin of Israel coming upon a goat that runs off into the wilderness. Like you don't want to see that goat again, right? It's like considering like it's a sin type of sin bearing thing. That's the idea. That's Leviticus chapter 16. You can read about that. Um, sin separates us from separates man from God. And here is this beautiful heavenly stuff. And then the thing laid on top of that is this thing that may represent like sin between us and God. You're never going to see all this beautiful heavenly stuff, guys. The, 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 the ironic priest might know about it, but nobody else gets to see it because there's these sin issues. Sin separates us from God, but Jesus, he bore our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So upon heaven comes sin. That's kind of how it seems to me, which... Looks a lot like Jesus. Uh, the third skin was made out of rams, ram skin, ram skin. A ram is also a sacrificial animal. In fact, specifically the first time that I can, that I think it's the first time we see a ram being used in a sacrificial sense in the Bible is Genesis 22, when Abraham offers a ram caught in the thicket, if you read the King James, right? And caught in a bush. And he offers this ram instead of Isaac, his son. And that whole thing pictures Jesus Christ very in a very neat way. Um, the, the ram skin, though, it was dyed also. It was dyed red. So the goat skin was just up there, but the ram skin was dyed red. It was dyed red. Um, so if, theoretically, this goat skin represents sin, and the ram skin represents maybe the offering for skin, sin, blood, the blood covering the sin, possibly. And then the final, the fourth skin, was badger skin. And depending on your translation, it'll translate this very differently. My research tells me it's probably seal skin, probably seal skin, um, as they were traveling along the coast. Um, but I could be wrong here. They debate on what this was. But basically, it's this ugly, thick, durable skin, the kind of stuff they would use to make sandals out of. So we're talking like a leathery type thickness, that sort of material used for sandals, used for um, things that are meant to be beat up and, and, and work for you, that kind of thing. And Christ came as a servant. Isaiah 53, 2 says he has no beauty that we should desire him. I'll tell you what, if you came and you saw the tabernacle from the outside, you would not have thought anything special about it. You would have been like, you're all camping around that? Israel, this is your glorious tabernacle? From the outside, it looks really plain. It's a big tent. Ugly. But on the inside, it looked like heaven. Unimpressive from the outside, but from the inside, it was the presence of God. I think the tabernacle represents Christ even possibly in its very structures and designs. Um, and its insides to represent the things that Jesus did and the things that Jesus was for us. But there's two items on the outside. On the outside of the tabernacle, we have the, the, the bronze altar. And this is where they would literally do offerings. They would actually offer animals on this altar. And it was an altar made out of wood and covered in bronze. No gold anymore. For the outside, there's no gold on the outside of the tabernacle. It's gold on the inside, outside's all bronze. Bronze, which <clears throat> some would say represents like judgment or wrath. Jesus' feet are like brass or bronze when he, in Revelation, shows up. Um, there's a few other verses that may support that. I'm not 100% sure on it, to be honest. Um, it was about, this was pretty big. It was about seven and a half feet wide and long. Um, so longer and wider than I am tall. I'm only about seven foot three, so... Um, um, it was <laughs> about four foot six inches tall. So, uh, well, it's about as tall as you, right? And, um, and, uh, and, and you can see there's horns on it. This was the horns of the altar where someone might go and run and be like, mercy, mercy, we want mercy. You know, and they might try to grab onto the horns, calling out for mercy upon the name of all that sacrifice that took place there. Interestingly enough, what happened on the inside was totally private. Nobody saw what happened inside the tabernacle. But what happened on that altar was totally public. And what was it? The death and offering of all these animals. And with Jesus, we didn't see some of the stuff that he went through, but we saw his offering. We saw his sacrifice. That was quite public. Interestingly, too, that you might miss this if you just read through casually, the incense that was burned on the inside, the incense that brought, that brought prayers to God, where did they get the fire to burn that incense? Well, they got it from the coals from that altar. So the coals upon which the blood of the sacrificial animals had dripped. 
those coals would be used to bring the incense before God. Our prayers are brought to God through the sacrifice of Jesus. The coal that touched the lips of Isaiah when he said, woe is me, I'm an unclean man of unclean lips, represent the coals upon which the sacrifice drips. Yet the only sacrifice we know about in heaven is the sacrifice and offering of Jesus. So that's another study, but it's neat. The bronze laver, the final piece of the puzzle, the bronze laver, this was literally for washing. That's what it's for. And it was made, we're told specifically made, from the mirrors of the Egyptian women. Remember the Israelites, they kind of plundered the Egyptians. They asked for gifts before they left. Hey, give us some stuff. And so then they gave them mirrors and they, they gathered the mirrors from the Egyptian women. They made them into this bronze laver. So it would have been this really, potentially really pretty looking thing. Maybe, maybe it was highly reflective. I don't know. Very possibly. Um, it was filled with water for ceremonial washing of the priests. And water has a picture in scripture as well. So we have the offerings, but we also have a cleansing that takes place there at the tabernacle. Ephesians 5.26 Speaking of Jesus and the church, it says that he may sanct- might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. With the word. The word of God, whether, whether this is talking about salvation washing, where the gospel, you know, we hear the gospel, we receive Christ, we're washed clean of our sins, or the sanctification cleansing that we need. Like Jesus says, you've already been washed and you just need to wash your hands or your feet, rather. <laughs> you need to wash your feet, that there's perhaps that element there as well. Um, the word of God perhaps is like this mirror that confronts us. And there's some people that see a picture there of the scripture as, as we gather near to God and we get in the word and we go, I need to be changed as these mirrors were used to turn into this washing device. That's James 1 uh, talks about the mirror. So very interesting stuff. So finally, the last thing I'll say about the tabernacle is this, and then we'll take any questions you guys might have and hear your thoughts and maybe pick something you picked up on. Um, the tabernacle... Again, it was the only location in Israel where these things took place. It was the one place where offerings and sacrifice were made, the one way for God to be with his people. And there was only one way to get into it as well. There was only one entrance into this place, one doorway that you you could use to get in. It was heaven on the inside, not so much on the outside. And then, of course, scripture says that Jesus himself, he tabernacled amongst us, There's at least three New Testament passages that I think really strongly support a connection typologically between Jesus and the tabernacle. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this this time. Uh, Thank you for this exciting study in your word, Jesus in the Old Testament. We pray you'd, you'd help us to just have insights to see the fullness of the meaning that you have always had in the text. Let our eyes be unveiled that we might see the truth of Christ through these things. And Jesus, we are so grateful that um, you're God with us that we enter into the presence of God um, freely, freely because you have once and for all paid the price for sin, not like them when they had to just always continually offering again and again and again because the sin was never ultimately totally dealt with. Yet through Christ, we have the living way offered once and for all. We're grateful. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the excitement and joy we have in your word as we study it. In Jesus' name, amen.